director of the, he's currently director of the um, Institute for East European Eurasian and Slavic Studies at Berkeley. He sits on the editorial boards of two leading journals in the field, um, Slavic Review and Contemporary European History. Um, his books, as I'm sure you um, all know and have read, uh, include Captive University, the Sovietization of East German, Czech and Polish Higher Education, uh, which was published in 2000 and was the winner of the um, 2001 George Beer Award of the American Historical Association, which was followed by From Enemy to Brother, The Revolution in Catholic che Teaching on the Jews, um, also a prize-winning book published by Harvard in 2012. And finally, the book um, that we're here to, to discuss and to celebrate, I guess, tonight, um, From Peoples into Nations, A History of Eastern Europe which was published by Princeton earlier this year. Um, and it's also, uh, it's also a, a great pleasure uh, to have uh, as discussant somebody who will also be very familiar to, to everyone here, uh, Jakob Benesch, lecturer in Central European History at CIS um, and author of the prize-winning uh, book, Workers and Nationalism, Czech and German Social Democracy in Habsburg, Austria from 1890. Uh, to 1918, which was published by Oxford in 2017, um, and is working on a fascinating new project um, on the era of the world wars in East Central Europe from the perspective of the countryside. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to hand the floor to the virtual floor um, to John, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, I really regret that I wasn't able to meet you in person in the spring uh, as we had planned, but the two of you are not only great historians, but you had the foresight to know that this would be a perfect occasion for a lecture on Eastern Europe to distract us all from world events, uh, which I have to say le left me feeling a bit like, uh, was, is it Gregor Zamza, the person who had the unpleasant dreams and then woke up that feeling transformed? I was hoping to find reality transformed, but I'm still waiting. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you, thank you all for attending and thank you to the institutions. This is very generous of you. Uh, now, so I'm gonna talk a, a bit about the, um, the, the core uh, message of my book and the approach of my book. I think it's safe to say uh, <clears throat> that in general, history writing stands <clears throat> in some relation to the recent past, uh, whether or not the author is aware of it. And I think that's also true of my book. The trend um, in recent years in writing about Eastern Europe can be called a-national and even anti-national the preferred perspective of historians has been cosmopolitan. And the idea is to get away from the confines of the nation state. Nationhood is not eternal, we are often reminded, but fabricated by human beings. Authors imagine nationhood as something that might have happened very differently than it did, or indeed not at all. For example, if one removes World War I from the past or imagines it happening later, one can conjure the multinational Habsburg empires continuing and thus delay from what a Western perspective seems the disastrous nation states of the interwar period, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Yugoslavia, etc. Mostly, as Peter Judson writes, these were not nation states, but miniature Habsburg empires, usually minus the tolerance. This argument not just reimagines the past, but it reflects the West's taking exception to the strange way East Europeans have understood nationalism. Um, the argument has been propelled most recently and directly by the Bosnian War of the 1990s, when poorly informed journalists claimed the conflict reflected ancient hatreds. So the job of professionals has been to show that this view is wrong. Broadly speaking, there have been three kinds of approaches. First, to say that the notion of a coherent Eastern Europe or Balkans is a creation of Westerners, usually Western writers who imputed something essential to the region between Germany and Russia, imagining it in terms of stereotypes, for example, of backwardness or irrational attachment to nationalism. Second and closely related, historians have argued that the East is not a place, character, is not only a place not characterized by ethnic nationalism, but if we recover stories from its past, we realize that many of its inhabitants resisted nationalism, essentially opting out, preferring to be multinational or nationally indifferent. Third is an older tradition, less polemical, represented strongly in economic history of portraying East Central Europe as a region characterized by lagging development in the socioeconomic and therefore political senses. All of these approaches are correct in their own ways. The last one perhaps most evidently because it relies on data such as crop yields, urbanization, or literacy. But regarding the first two approaches, who can deny that, that Westerners 
have mischaracterized Eastern Europe. It's not a place of ancient hatreds. Who could deny that some people were nationally indifferent and vast numbers were once multilingual, able to shift identities at a moment's notice. In his memoirs, Czesław Miłosz relates the way his grandmother in Vilno could suddenly be a German if the situation demanded it, or I should say, seem to be a German. Yet if one takes these arguments too far, one soon dissolves the region. It's at best a zone of semi-underdevelopment with no clear boundaries between Atlantic and the Urals. So at base, my book is an attempt to identify a way of sensibly talking about the Eastern Europe we know exists. It's not a place of clear geographical or political boundaries, but a common predicament. What unites East Europeans and gives my book a narrative thread is a common experience and understanding of nationhood. I agree with recent scholarship that for East Europeans, national identity is of course not and was not more important in everyday life than other kinds of identity. But what about in political life? What about the era of mass suffrage from the 1880s where a political class emerged that tried to build constituencies and win elections? In that kind of situation, I argue in the book, arguments about identity above all ethnic and national identity can be made and are made to take on seemingly life or death implications. I do not say that nationalism is the only story in Eastern Europe. There are processes other than the national one, other trends, events, stories, sensitivities. There's commerce and scholarship and sport and tourism and cuisine and a thousand other things that are inter and transnational. Nationalism is not something on people's minds in Eastern Europe 24 seven. Instead, I say that when it comes to political contestation, the struggle for power, the need to gain support through votes in a democracy, nationalism, or more precisely the national, becomes a common idiom which cannot be ignored. No politician, no matter how socialist or internationalist could afford after the 1880s to seem weak on nationalism. No politician who wanted to succeed could risk being outflanked in terms of his or her devotion to the national cause. Because if he did, and the politicians were mostly men, um, he indeed would be outflanked. Why? It's because arguments in the political realm in Eastern Europe are cast in terms of shame, where the metaphor of the family is imposed seemingly naturally and in effect irrefutably upon the discourse of the nation. In other words, those who are weak on the nation and its rights are said to be unconcerned about their own family. Those who don't care about the survival of the nation don't care about the survival of their grandparents, parents, and children. Of course, shaming is not unknown in the West. There were recruiting posters in World War I. What will you do when the Hun is at the door? The implication, if you don't fight, your wife or children will be attacked. The added twist in Eastern Europe is that such messages appeared not just in wartime, but in peacetime, and that nationalists argue with ferocious conviction that the foreigner already occupies your land, and if not stopped or constrained, will put an end to the life of your family, extended and close, not just their physical lives, but way of life, not through bombs or military occupation, but through schools at all levels and censorship and domination of media. In other words, the national enemy endangers your culture, which perhaps because it has been challenged has taken on paramount importance in many East Europeans' lives. Culture is not simply an important thing in people's lives, but the mode for imagining important things as such, absorbed from parents, then passed on to children, the translatable as well as the untranslatable. It's interesting to note that the originator of the term genocide, Raphael Lemkin, who grew up in Poland, was concerned at a deeper level precisely about the eradication of culture. It's also interesting and not surprising that Lemkin was very active in Zionist politics. In other words, Lemkin's engagement for culture as such began as engagement for a particular culture. In the book, I date a crucial origin moment for this special kind of concern for mortal dangers facing East Europeans culture to the late 18th century and an act of the Habsburg ruler, Joseph II. In the mid 1780s, he attempted to introduce German into his realm as the language of administration and education. And by doing so caused many Hungarians and some Czechs to fear that they would become just one more among Central Europe's groups of German speakers. Complaints rained upon the court in Vienna. Inhabitants of one county evoked the fate of the Etruscan city of Vei, who remembered it now. Like the Etruscans, the Magyars would disappear from history. In the words of Eva Balash, Joseph had touched some deep nerve, bringing dormant feelings to the surface, ushering in a new phase of national development. 
Joseph was insensitive to all pleas, and a generation later, concern over impending national disappearance had spawned political movements, first striving for cultural rights, then gradually for political autonomy. <clears throat> so in response to the impossible question of what Eastern Europe is, I say it is a region <clears throat> of sometimes shifting physical boundaries of small peoples living between empires whose national discourse is characterized by a special fear stoked for, for generations by their political classes that as peoples they might disappear from history. The next steps in the Habsburg lands involved the spread of this sense to the population at large. Combining insights from Hans Kohn, Miroslav Roch, and Henrik Bereshitsky, I contend that the spread of national identity of belonging to a community that extended beyond the horizon of one's town and indeed one's time was rapid and successful because it combined opportunities for individuals to, to succeed in the expanding world of proto-capitalism with impulses people felt in the age of romanticism to find meaning that transcends the material world. Let's look for a moment at the situation of the Czech lands in the 1840s. For centuries, growth had been slow and towns remained the preserves of elites speaking languages, usually German, far into the people in the surrounding countryside. Under such conditions, young Czech speakers coming to Prague to learn a craft or interstate service picked up German as the language of their new surroundings and they became in effect German. The influx was gradual and such newcomers were readily absorbed. As the feudal system declined and trade between city and countryside grew, however, the village became a client for middle-class traders and craftsmen from the cities. Urban areas grew and workers coming into them were soon too numerous to be easily absorbed. At the same time, as, as commerce expanded, traders who could, who, who could communicate in Czech with people in nearby villages gained advantages over those speaking only German. The process now reversed. Cities ceased Germanizing the rural population, streaming in from the countryside. Instead, as the Czech speakers became a torrent, the newcomers began to de-Germanize the city. Now an unquantifiable element enters the story, namely respect. Respect not only for oneself, but for the world from which one emerged, of one's parents and grandparents and everyone from whom one had derived a sense of what is important in life. Czech speakers in Prague were not content to find themselves in culturally foreign alien surroundings. Soon they wanted to domesticate the neighborhoods where they were settling, making them places where they would enjoy respect. They wanted to experience life as Czechs with no constraints in shops and trade in politics and education. There should be no cafe or club or casino where people looked at them strangely because they spoke their home language. This desire now spread beyond early enthusiasts, the men who had created modern Czech and written its first histories and established its first museum and made its way through small town elites to the masses. The political science, scientist Karl Deutsch discussed nationalism in terms of ease of communication. As society grew urban and modern, it became relatively more efficient and profitable to communicate with one large group of people than with another. That people was a modern nation. But Deutsch did not go far enough. The issue was not just ease of communication, but what was communicated. Czech speakers grew from a people into nation as increasing numbers of them arrived at the awareness of belonging to a community who looked upon the events of their day and comprehended them in compatible ways. They were not only people who expected and got the same punchline, they knew they were a people who expected and got the same punchline. They literally and figuratively caught the same jokes and they did so while German neighbors sat by in befuddlement, unable to discern what they saw as humorous or for that matter as tragic. Increasingly Czech patriots insisted that all Czech speakers ought to have the concern they had and shamed those who failed to understand their supposedly ultimate truths. Ethnic nationalism in this sense was a forceful and intolerant argument. There were of course people who felt more and less strongly about these issues despite the efforts of patriots but those who wanted to make a career in public life could not afford to claim that it did not matter that German elites did not respect Czech speakers as equal, that it did not matter when German parliamentarians in Prague or Vienna said the Czechs were speaking a language that should be heard only in the kitchen or stable and was not fit for good company. An ideology grew according to which this precious Czechness could survive only in bounded territory. This was the so-called doctrine of Bohemian states right. The idea that base, the basic political unit in what we now call Czechia was and had to be the kingdom of Bohemia, which had existed for centuries and was by nature Czech, according to the patriots, even when it was at the heart of the Holy Roman Empire. 
As a nation of European standing, Czechs not only had to have their own national space, history had predestined the space of this kingdom for them. And thus any talk of subdividing Bohemia into German and Czech districts was not only treason, but an evident absurdity. To give a sense of how compelling this doctrine was, consider the lot of five Czech social democrats who in 1897 dared to follow the party's internationalist line and refused to sign a state's right declaration of fellow Czech members of parliament. They paid an immediate price. Nationalist worker politicians formed a competing Czechoslovak National Socialist Party that grew into a pillar of the Czech system. And they accused social democrats of being traitors. The result was that Czech social democrats lost ground in the 1901 elections and never repeated that mistake again. They held to the national line and would not hear of the national districts within Bohemia that the German socialists desperately wanted in order to protect the German language from declining. This was a resolution, by the way, that seemed so commonsensical to, as to be advocated from afar by the editors of the New York Times. Yet as a result of their advocacy of workers' social and national rights, Czech Social Democrats became the, the strongest Czech party with 38% of the votes among Czechs in 1907. This Czech behavior did not and does not defy reason. The intuition that culture requires protected space to be protect protected space is not baseless. Authors who have not attempted to see things from this perspective, the Czech perspective, the perspective of Czech patriots, authors like Karl Shorsky or Sherry Berman write off the Czechs, including the social Democrats as nationalists and therefore somehow defying reason. They don't realize that famous German social Democrats, Austro Marxists like Otto Bauer or Karl Renner were themselves nationalists who assumed that superior German culture was bound to dominate Eastern Europe even well-informed Western authors adopt an imperial attitude. If only the small nations of Eastern Europe had not demanded freedom and with its sovereignty, then humanity would have been spared much grief. I was surprised to read one of my own colleagues advocating imperial peacekeeping, not simply of Franz Joseph, whom Habsburg enthusiasts of our day consider a kind of benign father figure, but of Prince Metternich. This colleague suggested that Metternich might serve as a model for our own time, but please note, in order to defend Metternich or the early reign of Franz Josef, one has to embrace a system that suppressed not only the national, but also the civic rights of millions of human beings. The phenomenon that I'm speaking of, namely the spread of a sense of belonging to peoples threatened with being swallowed in the torrents of imperial rule was much more than Czech or even Habsburg. To the North in the Polish lands and to the South in the Serb lands, when opportunities emerged for pursuing a politics aimed at enhancing autonomy, for an unconstrained Polish or Serb civil society within secure boundaries, then support came massively to the fore. Some of my, some of my positivist friends in Poland like to stress that the rule for the most part of the 19th century was cooperation with imperial authorities. Poles were loyal soldiers and officials of the Russian, Prussian or Austrian state apparatus. Still, when opportunities beckoned for asserting autonomy, no matter how slight, even collaborators deemed as traitors by extreme nationalists left at the chance. In 1860, at the dawn of Austria's constitutional era, Francis, Franz Josef chose as his first prime minister the Polish magnate Agenor Romuald Gołochowski, Galician governor since 1849 and owner of vast territories in Ukraine. As far as anyone in Vienna could tell, the multilingual Gołochowski was the exemplar of the loyal Habsburg statesman, supranational tolerant, conscientious. But within the Galician context, close observers knew him as a canny, low-key promoter of Polish interests who kept the nascent Ukrainian movement under wraps, refused to divide Galicia into Polish and Ukrainian districts, while insisting in order to keep up appearances that the, bu the bureaucracy used German in public, Golochowski quietly replaced Austrian and Czech officials with Poles. The university in Lemberg remained heavily German because it was founded by the Austrian state. But Gołochowski permitted Jagiellonian University in Kraków to revert to a Polish institution. Because he publicly identified as an Austrian, true Polish patriots derided him as a traitor. But like members of his class, he never gave up on an independent Poland. And its planting of Polish officials prepared the way for Polish self-rule in Galicia later in the decade. He later told Galicia's diet, Galicia's diet that abandoning hopes for independence was not in the Poles nature. Serbia was similar in important ways. If you read 
Some Western accounts, the uprising of 1804 in the Serb lands against Ottoman rule was simply against mismanagement and, and against corruption and not in favor of Serb control of territory. This was a time, according to theory, for example, of Ernst Gellner, Benedict Anderson, before Serbs even should have possessed modern national consciousness. Supposedly, they would have been delighted with Ottoman rule if only it had been just. Yet in fact, from the moment the rebels hold on territory was secure, though four centuries had passed since there was any native Serb statehood, it was self-evident that they would secure as much local rule as possible. No one in the rebel leadership objected the Sultan sympathizes with us, let us await his wise decisions and return to our status as a loyal subordinate controlled partially in the vast Ottoman domains. All we need is just imperial rule. Instead, the fighters went beyond demanding better governance. They were fighting for native control over territory and made common cause with Serbs elsewhere, extending into Montenegro. In fact, Serbs, though mostly illiterate, had a distinct sense of national identity and basic national rights gained from the tradition of epic poetry, handed down over many generations from the 15th century, at the center of which was the Kosovo myth. In 1807, a Serb Supreme Council governed the freed territory and the following year elected military leader Kara Georgia Petrovic, its leader, using the hereditary title Voyevod. In his speech of 1809, Kara George sketched his larger vision with reference to the Kosovo myth. Twice the hopes of Kosovo Christians were dashed that they would once again govern their own lands, he said. But now that almost all Slavic lands of the Turkish empire have been liberated, we hope that the hour of freedom will dawn for Kosovo as well. With Serbia's ostensible patron Russia, patron Russia preoccupied in its conflict with Napoleon, Ottoman forces regained Serb territory and Kara George fled to Austria in 1813. Yet as soon as his successor, Milos Obrenovic, secured territory after the next uprising in 1817, he negotiated an, an autonomous zone with the Ottomans. And that zone kept growing until it became fully independent in 1878. As is well known, that territory, although soon called a kingdom, was still considered insufficient in the Serb national movement. Thus the Balkan wars that took place just before World War I. Serbs are often portrayed as unreasonable irredentists in such long-term efforts over generations to claim as much territory inhabited by supposed co-ethnics as possible. But in fact, what they were doing was precisely what Italian, German, and indeed all other national movements east of the Rhine were doing in the 19th century, making claims on national territory in terms consistent with their own national mythologies. Thus, the East European perspective diverged from indeed was the opposite of the frequent romance we encounter in the West with multinational empires who kept peace and should have been preserved at all costs. In the region, as soon as national movements emerged, there was a sense that imperial rule, the rule of foreigners was incalculably worse than native rule. For Hungarians, Czechs, Poles, or Serbs, it was axiomatic that rule by a foreigner could not be just. This sensitivity remained as a kind of gravitational force in politics explaining why in 1939, or 1941, there was no question for Polish and Serb elites whether they would pact with Hitler as Hitler wanted. If Hungarian or Romanian elites cooperated with Nazi Germany, it was in order to secure sovereign national territory. Even during Stalinism, communists in Eastern Europe sought legitimacy through nationalism. At no point did Polish communists, for instance, attempt to harken back to Luxembourgism. They knew that kind of imperial multinationalism would be, would be the kiss of death in Polish society. What communist internationalism really was, what the Soviet bloc really was, was an effort of some half dozen communist parties to portray themselves as the most consistent, successful nationalists in their respective nation's histories. In all cases, communist politicians had to be wary of becoming outflanked by opponents claiming to be better Poles, better Slovaks, better Romanians, and of course, very tragically in the 1980s, better Serbs. So now I'm gonna move on to a conclusion. I have three remarks. First, the book attempts to be a corrective to anyone who thinks East Europeans are possessed of hatred toward each other. Eastern Europe is not a region of ancient hatreds. It is a region of uncommon concern for ethnic and national identity, precisely because East Europeans know that ethnic and national identity is constructed. That is made by humans. It is made by humans and can be destroyed by humans. I am not saying we have to embrace or identify with any particular national cause in Eastern Europe. 
merely that it behooves us to understand how East Europeans have understood their national causes, how they've been represented in the political realm. And their way of looking at nationhood does not fall behind some divide on the other side of which is irrationality. For example, it's not hard to understand that after World War II, hundreds of thousands of Czechs joined the Communist Party because they had come to understand that because Western liberalism could not protect the Czech nation, it could also not protect their families. It's in fact not difficult for us Westerners to com comprehend why people would desire respect for the language and culture of their community, that they would hate to be sneered at, would hate the idea that their powerful neighbors, Germans or Russians or Turks, felt that they represented a higher civilization. <clears throat> in fact, in much of the world, East Europeans' attitudes toward German, Russian, or Turkish rule would count as an anti-imperial, anti-colonial mindset, something found to be highly, highly legitimate. You would not last long in a graduate seminar at a North American university if your goal was to find some positive aspect of imperialism, say, of the British in India or the French in Africa. But where East Europe is concerned, the trend is precisely that, to rack our brains to figure out some way of rescuing imperial rule in the past, to decenter nation states and national causes, if not to imagine them out of history altogether. The result has been to defang imperial rule, to imagine above all in the late constitutional phase of Austria, ignoring the fact that Hungary had itself become a relentlessly denationalizing state after 1867. <clears throat> we tend to forget that if Czechs finally gained their own university or national theater in the 1880s, that followed decades of struggle and desperate fundraising. Where East Europe is concerned, imperial nostalgia overwhelms such knowledge. As noted, I was astounded to find my own dear colleague praising Metternich. Why? Because Metternich kept the lid on. <clears throat> Where East Europe is concerned, the anti-imperial struggle, anti-colonialism is considered so unseemly as to justify illiberal rule. But the story of indulging imperialism doesn't end with the Habsburgs. As Timothy Garton Ash discovered in the, in the 1980s to his dismay, the West German establishment, good liberals, <clears throat> perhaps the best in Europe, was quite content with the way the Soviet Union was keeping the peace in Eastern Europe. So much so that Theo Zomer of Die Zeit wrote after martial law was declared in Poland in December 1981, we have to wish General Jaruzelski success. So I think a first principle for the study of Eastern Europe should be if one is against imperial rule as such, one should be against it for Eastern Europe. Please note, contrary to an old French proverb that Tolstoy cites in War and Peace, to understand everything is not to forgive everything. Instead, we need to understand more in order for there to be less to forgive. It would be historically less to forgive if Woodrow Wilson had had a better understanding of how the words national self-determination would be heard and implemented in Eastern Europe. Recently at Berkeley, we heard the talk, a talk by Ambassador Wolfgang Petrich, who acted as UN High Commissioner in Bosnia in the late 1990s. Americans, he told us, simply could not understand the East European idea of nationhood and were astounded when Bosnia was evidently failing to cohere. Petrich recalled getting frequent impatient phone calls from Dick Holbrook, complaining that he, Petrich, was not doing enough to make that state succeed. Please note, by saying these words, I am not saying that Serbs and Croats and Muslims are divided by ancient hatreds, but rather that we should not be surprised that the entity of Bosnia is not seen as a nation, let alone nation state by many, perhaps most of its inhabitants, and that therefore it is unlikely to fulfill the hopes of the diplomats at Dayton. That would have been good to know beforehand. Point two, the East European sensitivity to nationhood is not unknown outside of Eastern Europe. I had a sabbatical earlier this year in Northern Ireland and discovered that fears of ethnic extinction are very much alive there among the so-called nationalist population, that is those who can consider themselves ethnically Irish. I felt right back in the old Habsburg empire when I learned that the regional legislature outside Belfast, the Stormont, had been dysfunctional for, se for several years, partly because of disputes about equal treatment of the Irish language, a language very, very few people speak on an everyday basis, even those who are able to speak that language. The challenge for governance in Ulster is reminiscent of old Bohemia, two groups that see the region as their own kind of cultural property. One could say that Eastern Europe before 1945 was like a band of Ulsters extending from the Adriatic to the Baltic. Third and final point, 
Northern Ireland is perhaps even more interesting for East Europeanists for the other group, the so-called unionists or loyalists who identify not just with Britain, but with England. Just across the river Lagan from the flat where I lived with my daughter during our, my sabbatical, I used to take walks near a housing estate in East Belfast where one would see not just tattered Union Jacks flying from poles, but banners with a St. George cross. Of course, Ulster's loyalists are the best English patriots. In the 1990s, Michael Ignatiev talked to one who lived close to the border of the Irish Republic, a certain Dick Sturrett. Sturrett chastised the English for no longer singing God Save the Queen in their movie houses. They don't seem to have a story to tell, any song to sing, Dick says. They don't seem to know who they are. We find similar situations among Russians in Latvia, French speakers in Quebec, or the Germans who once lived in Bohemia and all of these places, far beyond the secure metropole, local ethnics had a far sharper appreciation of the dangers, not only of not having a story to tell, but of not being able to pass that story on to their children. What these stories tell us is not only that fear of ethnic extinction is not unique to Eastern Europe, but that the very notion of Eastern Europe as a region characterized by ethnic nationalism versus Western Europe and North America as an area of civic nationalism is wrong. Every nation of citizens, that is civic nation, looks back to some extent to common rituals, symbols, myths, and origin stories, that is to forms of ethnicity. And every nation united in culture and common origin story, that is in ethnicity, aspires to becoming a community of citizens. Civic and ethnic are present in every nation. If the ethnic side of nationalism is more pronounced in Eastern Europe, that's because the nation's cultures have been threatened in ways that are hardly known in powerful imperial nation states like Germany or France. The French may be famously touchy about the purity of their language, but there is no general concern that French culture as such might disappear from history. Still, the ethnic of course exists in France, though it's usually more deeply buried than in Eastern Europe. And as in, East Europe, as in Europe's East, national identity in France is a field of political contestation, something that can and is used by politicians hoping to win elections, something whose meaning is a matter of debate, perhaps not a daily plebiscite as Renan defined the nation, but a source of constant struggle for clarity about what holds us together as a polity. What, what recent history shows is that it's usually the political left, reminiscent of the old internationalist Czech Social Democrats in Bohemia, who are more hesitant to shape ideas of nation in the sense of a common set of ideas about identity. We on the left are much worse in making emotional appeals to shared culture, a British colleague admitted to me during my stay in Belfast. The left is much worse at appealing to emotion in general. But please recall, nationalism was originally a left of center phenomenon and its causes for liberation, for rights against, against fascism, for democracy are not conservative. So nation understood as a field of political contestation about what the nation can and should mean is unavoidably and necessarily an ongoing plebiscite about what kind of nation one wants to celebrate. Does one favor a nationalism that relies upon, not upon fear, but upon inspiration, that is curious about other nations rather than hostile to them, that relies upon culture as a way to unite rather than divide, that endeavors to break down walls rather than build them? If there is no clear distinction between ethnic and civic nationalism, the political left should by no means give up the field of ethnic nationalism to the right. Why should the left not be concerned about culture, ethnicity, about common songs to sing, about symbols, the deep and more proximate common stories that hold the people together? If the left insists on treating nationhood as an imagined and mostly unfortunate fiction, as something you can take or leave or be wholly indifferent about, it will continue to be reminded for, that for most people who, who cast ballots, nationhood is a fact, their ballots will go to the right. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that absolutely fabulous talk. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jakob straight away to, to, um, to offer his thoughts um, in, the, in the comment, and then we'll move to a discussion. But thank you again. Uh, thanks so much, Celia, uh, and uh, thanks to you, Celia, for originally proposing uh, that we that we host John. And I'm also sorry that he couldn't be with us in London. Maybe we'll find 
uh, an opportunity to to make that happen at some time. Um, it's also a great honor for me to uh, be offering the comment uh, on John's book, um, on John's work, because John is uh, someone who's um, taught me, in effect, uh, from the very beginning of my career as a professional historian. So um, I am, uh, yeah, touched by this opportunity as well. So to start, I'd like to say that this is a remarkable book. Uh, and I think we should be grateful to John for writing it. It's comprehensive in a way that few books are. It weaves together virtually all of the national histories of Eastern Europe in a coherent and compelling way. It combines rich detail from the author's extensive decades long study of the subject with an engaging narrative, which also has a consistent argument. In other words, this is history on a large scale at its best. I particularly enjoyed and learned a great deal from the chapters on the communist era in Eastern Europe, a context John experienced personally as a young researcher. If for nothing else, everyone should get the book to read those chapters. There, as elsewhere in the book, John persuasively shows how contests over national leadership and national meaning framed important political and cultural developments in the region. Communists, like fascists and liberal Democrats, did not just try to impose their visions of the world on everyone else. And you, most of you will recall that Eric Hobsbawm famously argued that this was the, the three-way struggle that defined the 20th century. In Eastern Europe, each of these ideological groupings also claimed that they were best suited to lead or liberate the nation. Every successful political actor in Eastern Europe has been compelled to make this claim in one way or another. Nationalism has accompanied Eastern Europeans throughout the modern era, but its content has constantly evolved, been reinvented, and been challenged by new self-defined groups, uh, including peasants, a class that, pe that John devotes one uh, particularly interesting chapter to. His view is an unapologetically emic or interior one. Much of the theoretical literature on nationalism and much recent scholarship on East Central Europe takes a somewhat ironical edic view, showing the real limits that nationalism faced in spite of what, nationalism, in spite of what nationalists themselves said. Without denying the artifice and contradictoriness of national pro projects, John reminds us of their stubborn persistence in this part of the world. And I think he's mostly right. I say mostly because I have a somewhat different take on one of the book's core arguments that is about the distinctiveness of Eastern Europe as a region. Eastern Europe's defining feature in John's telling is the ever, ever present possibility that its peoples might disappear. National movements are a logical, if not entirely defensible, response to this possibility. The tenacity of East European nationalism corresponds to their adherence fear of extinction. And extinction here does not only refer to the extreme circumstances of the Second World War when this meant physical annihilation or removal. It also refers to the possibility that a vernacular language will fall into such neglect that its speakers will prefer using a more elevated language or a more practical language. A people's distinctiveness defined by using that vernacular will consequently disappear. This was the fear that motivated the so-called national awakeners among the Czechs, Hungarians, and other peoples, precisely the moment where John begins his story. But I think there was another side to nationalism's appeal in Eastern Europe. The possibility of self-assertion, of expansion, and of political existence for the very first time. Geopolitics in this part of Europe was much less, much less stable than in the proto-nation-state kingdoms of Western Europe. The shape and character of the Habsburg dominions fluctuated wildly over the early modern period. So too did the dominions of the Ottomans, the Habsburg's main challengers in Southeastern Europe. Poland-Lithuania shockingly disappeared from the map of Europe in the latter half of the 18th century. I would say that such rapid reversals of political fortune did not only breed fear, but also hope and ambition. The same, I would say, could not be said of, say, the Basques, the Catalans, the Bretons, or the Welsh in the same period. In other words, of the small stateless peoples of Western Europe. In their eyes, why should the Serbs 
pushed over the centuries into the military frontier and the Banat not try to resurrect the kingdom of Dushan the Mighty? Why should Slovaks, relegated to village life in the northern highlands of Hungary, not dream of the great Moravian state of the ninth century? Why should the Magyars not extend their culture to all the territories conquered by Arpad? This is one facet of Eastern European nationalism that I would argue is important to understanding its distinctiveness. It's implicit in some of what John discusses, but I think it could be more explicit. And consequently, I might have emphasized a couple subjects somewhat more than, than John does. One is the First World War, when national self-determination took on completely new meaning. Uh, he has an illuminating chapter in the book called 1919, in which key wartime developments are discussed as a prelude to the peace settlement. Yet it was during the conflict, not just after it, that the national ambitions of the Czechs, Serbs, Croats, Poles, and others were reshaped. This was not just about safeguarding their existence against possible extinction, even though arguably that was a factor too, especially early in the war. Instead, emigres and oppositional groups within the monarchy, within the Habsburg monarchy, jockeyed for influence, floating competing blueprints for what came to be known as national self-determination. Karel Kramaj, the Czech politician, entertained hopes for a Russian victory that would absorb the Czechs and other Western Slavs into a vast Slavic state. Józef Piłsudski established Polish legions to confer legitimacy on Polish independence, Polish independence whatever shape that would take. Tomasz Masaryk and his friend, Robert Seton Watson, hoped that the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, which they established in 19, 1915, would boost the cause of Czech and Slovak independence. Until 1918, such ideas were admittedly outliers because most versions of national self-determination were premised on the continuing existence of the Habsburg monarchy. But with the monarchy's collapse, the national political horizons of all the peoples of Eastern Europe expanded radically. It's worth mentioning that such national fantasies of all sorts and articulated by all kinds of actors eclipse the urge for mere survival. The other topic I would like to have seen a little bit more space devoted to is Jewish self-determination and the wide spectrum of possibilities that existed in that realm before their disappearance in the fires of the Second World War. John does briefly discuss Herzl's Zionism, how it emerged as a reaction to anti-Semitism and how it envisioned a Jewish homeland outside of Europe. But Herzl, I think, was not just motivated by the threat that anti-Semites posed to European Jewry. He also shared the belief of many nationalists in his part of Europe that a strong, self-sufficient nation could be conjured into existence and achieve polit political independence in the space of a couple generations. Herzl's followers took a cue from neighboring nationalisms as well in trying to make Hebrew into a living language for everyday use. And Zionism was not the entirety of Jewish national politics in East Central Europe. There was the Socialist Bund, and the diaspora nationalism of Simon Dubnov. And there was Hasidism in many shtetl communities, communities in the East and in the Western parts of Eastern Europe, there remained the old Haskalah vision of assimilation to the Gentile nation alongside a self-sustaining community of Jewish religious practice and kinship. So to wrap up my remarks, John writes in the conclusion that his book, quote, has shown that nationalism was not contingent but rather situational. Its strength depended above all on the perceived level, the perceived, excuse me, depended above all on the level of perceived threat to a particular ethnicity, end quote. But have these ethnic nations only been defending themselves? I wonder if this doesn't underestimate the imaginative, creative, but also expansionist sides of nationalism in Eastern Europe. Uh, and that brings me that brings me to the end of my uh, gentle critique of this excellent book. Uh, congratulations, John, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so 